So let's turn back to John 11 and look at this wonderful theme of the believer's glorious hope. I'm going to ask this passage just five uh, questions. And uh, the first uh, is why the delay? Because really this story begins with a bit of a fog going on, isn't it? Everything doesn't seem to be quite going to plan. Uh, so Jesus gets this sort of message from very, very close friends that Lazarus is seriously ill and Jesus does nothing. Stays there two days. Well, there's, there's a problem straight away, isn't there? And then um, when Jesus uh, uh, tells his disciples it's time now to, to go, go to, to Bethany, uh, their, res their response, oh, no, you can't do that, Jesus. They're going to stone you if you get there. So I think this introduces the deep and important subject of the mystery of providence. Um, how we determine what the plan of God is for our lives. Because it, it seems a bit cruel that our loving Saviour, the most kind and loving human being that has ever lived, allows his one of his best friends to die, knowing all the pain and a hurt that will that will cause. But we all believe, uh, and Lazarus and Mary and Martha and all those in Bethany believe that God is in control. But as our lives begin to plan, uh, span out and, and, and things happen to us, they're often uh, bewildering, aren't they? Um, there's a sort of implied criticism, isn't there? Uh, it, it, with Mary and Martha, they've obviously been talking at home about this. Why, why is Jesus not here? Why, why is he not here? And they say the same thing, don't they, to Jesus? If you had been here, Lord, our brother would not have died. Jesus, you love Lazarus. You love us. We've looked after you. Why, why have you let this happened. I remember many years ago um, I was preaching at a, a church in Warrington and um, they decided to go through the Psalms and um, uh, the Psalm that uh, I was given, I think it was Psalm 10, begins, uh, Why, O Lord? And you know the, the theme of that sermon was the why questions are always the hardest. And here the why questions to Jesus show how hurt and suffering people were. Why do so many seemingly strange things, bad things, difficult things happen to us when God <coughs> is in control of everything that happened? Because I take both the papers, uh, I don't know whether it was ET or EN, but um, uh, the story of the Dean in, um, in, in, in Butcher being killed. Is that E.T.? Oh, hello. <laughs> thank goodness for that. Uh, but, um, but no, not thank goodness for that. I mean, what a tragic story. What a tragic story. One of those with his hands tied behind his back and shot in the back of the head. The Dean of an evangelical seminary uh, on, in the suburbs of Kiev. Can I explain why God allows that to happen? Of course I can't, because the why questions are always uh, the hardest. You know, sometimes um, when we look back and, uh, and look at the sort of path, the trackway that our life has taken, sometimes we say, oh, now we understand years later why ABC happened and why that led to X, Y, Z. And we see, oh, yeah, we were, you know, that was a really difficult time in our lives. But now we look back, we can see how the hand of God was on it in a mysterious way. But other times, we never know. We never know why certain things, perhaps even tragedies, have happened to us in uh, our lives. Um, and uh, it remains ever a mystery to us 
which is probably why when John Flavel wrote a book on providence, he called it the mystery of providence. Our ways are not like God's ways. Our thoughts are not as high as God's thoughts are. And faith shines brightly in these times of darkness and uh, uh, uncertainty. Now, there's a very strange verse in here, isn't there? In verse 9, which it's very hard to understand. One of those rather difficult sayings of Jesus. Are there not 12 hours in the day? Uh, if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, light and darkness is a, are major themes in John's Gospel. And you're either children of light or children of darkness. And uh, other Gospel uh, uh, New Testament writers will make the same point. But um, is he here talking about uh, the unbeliever and the believer? Is he talking about children, uh, people of light, people of night in, in that sense? Or is he saying in this context, because it's in the context of this mystery of providence, that's where it comes, that um, just after the Jews are about to stone you, O Lord, and, uh, and before he begins to explain to them that Lazarus has died and he has not gone uh, and, and tried to, to, to heal him. And so, perhaps even for the believer, sometimes, as it were, we... we we see the light of God's purposes in our lives. We begin to understand them. Other times uh, we don't. Is, is that what Jesus is referring to? Here it's very hard uh, uh, to, uh, to, to say. So um, here we are uh, with this mystery uh, of pro providence. The disciples are fearful of going to Jerusalem lest Jesus gets stoned. And yet we know the climax uh, is beginning of Jesus' life and ministry is coming to um, an end. And it's an insight into the working out of God's purposes of which Lazarus, of course, is a massive, massive uh, part of revealing our Saviour's true uh, work. What can we say about the mystery of providence? We can say three things for certain. That uh, things God does are always for his glory. Secondly, they are always the working out of his eternal plan. And thirdly, they are always for our good. Because everything, everything, even the worst tragedy you could imagine ultimately works for our good now secondly how does how does jesus describe death let's look at verse 11 he says our friend lazarus has fallen asleep but i go to awaken him the disciples said to him lord if he has fallen asleep he will recover now jesus had spoken of his death but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. So it's one of those wonderful words for death that we find in the New Testament. Uh, Paul uses them. Must be his favourite expression as well. He uses them in 1 Thessalonians and in uh, 1 uh, uh, Corinthians. Jesus used it when he was going to Jairus' daughter who had died. And if you remember the story, he said, she's just asleep. And everybody started mocking him and falling about in laughter because they knew that she uh, had, had died. What a, what a beautiful description of death uh, uh, this is. It reminds me of my, my childhood when, you know, your mum puts you to bed at night, doesn't she, and tucks you in. And there she is again in the morning to wake you up again. And that's a lovely picture of, uh, of, of death, because uh, when we die, we will wake up again uh, one, one day. Um, sometimes it's not with the gentle, gentle voice of your mother. I think 
uh, if I understand the, the scripture correctly, uh, I think it's going to be like a mighty alarm bell going off, actually, because there's going to be a great shout and a trumpet blasting and the graves are open and the dead in Christ uh, rise. Remember uh, when I had a, a general anaesthetic a few times uh, for fairly minor surgery, Remember the first time the surgeon or yeah surgeon or anaesthetist put all the all those sort of things on you to make sure your heart was still going and all the wires wherever you were and they put a needle in your arm and then they started putting things into my arm through the needle and I said um, and after about three or four of these I said I'm still here he says you won't be after this one and you know if only you could go to sleep like that every day you can imagine that's like falling off a cliff zonk you're gone uh, and then i think you're woken up and that's all Trevor, and you know you started off in this little little room where you know they were preparing you for surgery and you wake up in this recovery ward of people and you wonder where you are and i think that's a little bit like the resurrection we we die in this world, but we wake up in a world where heaven comes to earth and our Saviour is there. And we see him and we are like him. And God dwells with us for ever. So, yeah, a lovely, lovely childlike way of describing uh, death. Many people say, I think rightly so, that um, uh, we have no fear of death because we've got this glorious hope. But some say we have a uh, fear of uh, dying because it may be painful. Perhaps the, the gate that takes us from this life to the next is, is a painful one. But we know that God's grace is always sufficient. It has been in our life. It will be in our death. And let us, let us pray that, like with John Wesley, when he said, my people die well, that we die praising and thanking our wonderful God and our wonderful Saviour. Now, thirdly, what is the believer's glorious hope? Now, Martha is a pretty good theologian. Now, it was Mary that was sitting at Jesus' feet uh, while Martha was doing all the housework, and yet, yet she comes up with the most brilliant of answers to this question. Look at verse 23. Martha said to him, uh, I, I know that he will, uh, what Jesus said, your brother will rise again in verse 23. And Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who believes, lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Wow. 10 out of 10 for that answer. No, no, no misspellings there either, I don't think at all. We're absolutely, absolutely nailed that one. Utter clarity. How does she know that? How does she know that when Christ returns, uh, there will be this great and glorious resurrection? Well, I think it's because of the, um, uh, the, the, the Old Testament, isn't it? And uh, the promises that we... Uh, we find there, you may well be aware of them. Uh, there's two really clear passages, one in the last chapter of Daniel, at the beginning of chapter 12, and at the end, where in Daniel 12, 2, uh, Daniel says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. <clears throat> and those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars for ever and ever. And towards the end of the chapter, it says in verse 13, but go your way to, till the end, 
and you shall rest, and you shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. But perhaps the, the best and greatest uh, promise of this wonderful resurrection is Job in Job 19, the suffering Job, the Job who had the same problem of the mystery of providence, of course, uh, that Jesus' disciples and Mary and Martha had. In Job 25, in words beautifully set to music in Handel's Messiah, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has, has been thus destroyed, Yet in my flesh, says Job, in my flesh, in my body, I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. That's the glorious hope of the believer. Now, that's why I, I, I chose to call this sermon... Uh, uh, the glorious hope of the believer rather than the glorious hope of the Christian. Because the hope in the Old Testament, where there were believers waiting for the coming Saviour, and the hope in the New Testament, and on into our day, when the Saviour has come and it's in the good news that there is now this great promise of resurrection, uh, uh, they bring the believers of the Old Testament who are looking forward to the coming Saviour and those of us who are believers looking back as Christians to the coming uh, and saving work of Christ have exactly the same hope. The dead in Christ rise first. Uh, those who are still alive are changed. We're caught up to meet him in the air. There's a judgment day. Heaven comes to earth, Eden is restored, God dwells with his people forever and ever. So the question Jesus asked Martha is one that every preacher needs to ask every con uh, congregation uh, when we go into John 11. Martha, do you believe this? So, boys and girls, men and women, here tonight, do you believe this? Is this your hope? Is, is this what you are looking for? Do you know, do you have the same faith in the same Saviour that Martha had? Can you give that amazing answer when Jesus said he, he is the resurrection and the life? Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God, who is coming into this world. Now, fourthly, why the tears? Now, parting uh, uh, always causes uh, of grief and, uh, and pain and sadness. But this account in verse 30 is absolutely amazing. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Now, isn't this absolutely wonderful <clears throat> that we have a God who weeps, who knows grief and sorrow uh, and human emotion, understands mourning, 
understands people's bereavement and loss uh, in death. A saviour who cares. Jesus wept. The God-man had human emotions. It's, it's just one of those strange things, isn't it, that when you see somebody in great emotional stress and they're like crying on your shoulder, your, your own eyes just sort of water up, don't they? You can't, you can't avoid it. It's, it's a natural human reaction. I, I know I've had a couple of my children that had, um, you know, serious uh, setbacks with, uh, with their partners and, uh, and uh, when the whole thing broke down, they want to cry on dad's shoulder and you, you, you share their, their emotion. Jesus is doing exactly that here, a saviour who cares. But we've also got a, a loving heavenly father who cares, haven't we? If you turn to 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3, there's this little passage of five verses. And amazingly, the word comfort comes ten times in this short passage, talking of our Heavenly Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, and if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Now, the word comfort there is the word parakletus, which means one called alongside. It's a, it's a name that's given to the, the whole Holy Spirit. And in the, in the Greek, it's, it's a father, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit stronger word than our word comfort. Our word comfort is often sort of fairly sort of passive when you put arms around people and console them. And it's a, perhaps a sort of, a, you know, try to, to care and to, to, to sort of, as it were, uh, give some, some words of, of comfort and help and peace to them. But perhaps in, in the Greek, it also has a, a, a stronger meaning, which is really to, in, to encourage, to, to strengthen, to fortify, to, to make you able to be strong in this situation. Now, I like both our, our softer English word comfort and the, perhaps the more accurate Greek word to, to strengthen. And, uh, and, and, and here, we, here we find a God who comforts his people, a loving Heavenly Father. We have a, a Saviour who weeps at his best friend's tomb. We have a Holy Spirit who is the one called aside uh, to comfort us and help us uh, in our times of need. Uh, pagan, pagan gods, false gods, are not gods that weep. The Trinity is a God that knows what it is to weep in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it's amazing that Jesus is so overwhelmed with, uh, with sorrow when he knows exactly what he's going to do and what the, the good end, end, uh, end uh, uh, story will be uh, to, to this. Uh, but he was still deeply troubled in his spirit, uh, John uh, records, and is about to do what I believe possibly is the greatest miracle of his life. 
raising Lazarus from the dead. There's been lots of resurrections in the Bible. Um, Elijah and Elisha uh, raised people. Um, Jesus raised the uh, the widow of Nan's son. He he raised uh, Jairus's daughter. Um, but all, all these uh, incidents up until uh, when Christ raises Lazarus, they've all been sort of same day resurrections, you know, in, and still in today uh, in, in those sort of hot countries in the Middle East, you bury the same day. Even in Albania, where I've been regularly, next, next day at, at the latest. And uh, because of, of the condition of the, uh, the body, as Martha, not very subtly, uh, reminds um, uh, Jesus when he asks the stone to be rolled to get way. Uh, the ESV is, is, is so conservative that when, when it, it, it translated that there may be an odour. Uh, the AV was a bit more blunt, but Lord, he stinketh. This is the resurrection of a decayed body after four days. This is the miracle of all miracles. Corruption has set in uh, an impossible thing to do, but the Lord of glory can do the impossible. Now finally, uh, what was the purpose of this miracle? Well, I think there's obviously two purposes. One is to demonstrate that Jesus really is the resurrection and the life, and as his the climax of his life and ministry is about to happen with his arrest and death and burial uh, and resurrection. It's all pointing to that. Uh, Jesus you know, rose on the third day, Lazarus is four days in the grave. His, his like, as it were, the, the, the dress rehearsal of the main event in, in Jesus's life. But it also points to uh, our own uh, resurrection as well. If you turn to Acts 2, there's an uh, amazing take on this in Peter's uh, uh, sermon on the day of Pentecost. In verse 24, he talks about God raising up Jesus, loosing, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Then he quotes from Psalm 16, for David says concerning him, concerning Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also would dwell in hope, for you would not abandon my soul to Hades. Hades there really is the place of the dead and it's the same word, shell, which both in the Greek Hades and in the Hebrew shell, the vast majority of times means the grave, which it certainly does here, because it goes on to say, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have, no, have made known to me the paths of life, and you will make me full of gladness in your presence. Now, P Peter's take on this story is absolutely breathtaking. It's amazing. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence, says, says Peter, the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. But, but being a, therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And he couldn't make this more clear with the next verse, could he? It's not talking, uh, 
about David because Jesus has been raised from the dead and is at God's right hand. For David did not ascend into heaven. But he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let the house of Israel therefore know for a certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The great hope of David, of all the Old Testament saints, of all us New Testament believers, is the glorious resurrection when Jesus returns. He makes that clear, doesn't he, in John 14. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again. He will return and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Uh, Warren and I have got a beautiful friend in Stuart Olliot, and um, on his wife Doris's grave, uh, everybody calls her Dole, so let's call her Dole's grave, it says, the, res the resurrection bed of Doris Olliot. That's what the grave is is and uh, and of course we're here talking about the the final resurrection aren't we that uh, that paul uh, speaks about in 1 corinthians 15 this is what he says there in verse 50 i tell you this brothers flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable behold i tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed for this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immor Im immortality and when perishable puts on the imperishable and mortal puts on immortality then shall come to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory O death where is your victory O death or grave where is your sting you see Lazarus of course one day went back to the tomb and so did Mary and Martha and so did Jesus's disciples who were witnessing this story uh, all those people that have been raised in the Bible all went back to the grave so these incredible miraculous happenings were not the the greatest miracle of all that's when Christ returns and this body not designed for the new heaven and new earth will be changed into this glorious, imperishable, immortal body that will last for all eternity. One last thought uh, uh, as, I, as I close. Um, I, one of my, my, my most favorite doctrine uh, is union with Christ used to be justification by faith, but that's, that's still a very close number two. Now, why is union with Christ my favourite doctrine? Well, because it works both ways. What was true of Jesus uh, becomes true for us. So we are buried with Christ uh, in his grave. We die with Christ. We are raised uh, uh, with Christ. If it happened to Jesus, it happened to us. Now, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says that the three things of most importance, first importance, he says, is that Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ was raised. Now, I've heard quite a lot of sermons, obviously, on Jesus' death and on his resurrection. i have yet to hear, after all these decades, a sermon on Jesus' burial. One of the things, says Paul, of first importance now why is that important well because we're united with christ in his death and burial and resurrection but he's also united with us 
in ours. He's united with us in our death. He's united to us in our resurrection bed, in our grave. He's united with us in the resurrection when we're brought to this wonderful new life for eternity. When heaven comes to earth and we are forever with the Lord. So we don't grieve, do we, as those who have no hope. The believer has the most glorious hope that in Christ there really is eternal life. And at the end of 1 Thessalonians 4, when Paul talks about us being caught up in the clouds and meeting the Lord and always being with the Lord, he says, therefore encourage one another with these words, parakletos, comfort, strengthen, encourage, comfort one another with these words.